we are going to begin with this next uh, session of uh, our web seminar. Today we will have uh, uh, the participation of uh, Karl Kunisch from University of Graz. Uh, I profit to thank him for accepting to give a talk here. And he's going to present a uh, work on uh, solution concepts for optimal feedback control of nonlinear partial differential equations. So uh, uh, when you want, uh, you can start and uh, welcome. And uh, thank you very much for accepting to participate. Well, thank you very much, Enrique. Thanks everybody for inviting me on the, this nice group of people who have started this uh, seminar, it's called Crisis Seminar. I didn't put this because it's too heavy. I just called it Web Seminar for today. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks for everyone who chose to join us. Um, I'm Karl Kunisch. Uh, just as maybe I'm one of the first ones uh, who comes from so far east. So just to make sure. I'm in Graz, typically working in Graz, but I also have a joint appointment in Linz. We have an academy institute in Linz, just to make sure. Here is Vienna, and now I have to zoom out, out, out. Here is France, Germany, Spain, and maybe some people from Mexico have joined in. So thanks for coming, and uh, let's switch to uh, full screen now. and. Um, start with the mathematics. I should say that, yeah, I'm from Graz. I, I'm also working partially at the Radon Institute of the Austrian Academy of Science in Linz. I am very lucky to have fantastic collaborators who helped on various aspects of the work that I'm presenting. There's Tobias Breiten, who has recently moved, moved to the uh, Technical University in Berlin, Dante Kalise, who was actually also here at the Radon Institute. That's where we got to know each other, but he has moved uh, to Nottingham at last now. There is Laurent Pfeiffer, who went, uh, who was with me in Graz, who went to Paris, Paris, and Daniel Walter who might listen in. He is just in the one or two doors, one or two doors down this hall. I know that maybe there are quite a few of you who are really working on controllability. I, my topic today is rather optimal control. So we are looking at <coughs> cost functional, minimizing an infinite horizon cost Ly plus some cost on the control and there's a dynamical system Y dot is Fy plus Bu. I insist on the fact that the F is nonlinear here, is allowed to be nonlinear. Otherwise I try to not be too technical, uh, <laughs> at least I try. Uh, the, the aspects that I want to present uh, you can think of it as an ODE or as a dynamical system, as a nonlinear heat equation or semi-linear heat equation. Um, the nonlinearity is such that F at zero is zero, L at zero is zero, so that zero is in fact a steady state. And why do we formulate problems like this? Because we want to do stabilization. Stabilization is one of the most important application areas conceptually for optimal control in the first place. Okay, now we would like <clears throat> today, not only to solve this somehow, but we would like to solve it in a feedback form. And to do it in a feedback form, it's important to introduce the so-called optimal value function V. For a reason which is not so transparent at the moment, anyway, we define V of X as the solution of this problem the, as a function of the initial value, Y at zero is equal to X. This is the value function. 
So what's so important about it? Just be patient for a moment. First, if we have it, then it satisfies the hamilton jacobi bellman equation, which is this equation written in blue here. It's clear that <clears throat> v at zero is zero. If x is equal to zero, since f is zero is zero, l is zero, everything is zero. So th this boundary condition is clear. And then there is this nonlinear hyperbolic first order hyperbolic differential equation in the unknown v or gradient v. And well, to make things a little bit more difficult, it's not really a, only an equation at the beginning. Actually, we even to write it down, we have to solve an optimization problem first with respect to u. And then we have the PDE that I was talking about gradient for, for the unknown v. In the specific case, and that's what I consider today most of the time, if u is a linear, if u is a linear space, and if since I have chosen this cost quadratic in the in the cost functional and affine in the state equation, we can solve by hand with respect to u. And I can stick in u star the optimizer, and I get a Nonlinear quadratic nonlinearity in the gradient V. This is the HGB equation. Of course, we know that this is formal in, because we need V to be C1 to have this equation holding. Otherwise, we need to talk about viscosity solutions. Viscosity solutions I take for granted today, or I assume that V is anyway C1. This is, has been very important, it's still a very important topic, but I'd rather talk about concepts for solving this equation. Why would I be interested in solving it? If for a moment you assume that we have V in our hands, we have a formula or at least a computer code which gives it to us, then we have a U star, the optimizer. We can take this U star, we stick it in here. We, that's what's called closing the loop. We stick it in this equation. And we have just <clears throat> a semi-linear equation to solve uh, to have a formula for the optimal trajectories. So now you see why it was so important what the role of x was. The role of x is now we evaluate the cost functional or the gradient of the cost functional along the trajectory. So you may still say, why not just solve the original problem it's just nothing, it's an optimization. We have the difficulty with the infinite, infinite interval, yes. Well, we are so interested in what's called closed loop, we're replacing u by a function here of the state. We are so interested in it because if there is, a, say, a noise entering into the system, which I didn't indicate here, if there's a noise part, then if the trajectory is not where it should be, at least we immediately have a formula which recognizes what we should do at that moment if the state happens to be at y of t. Fine. So, we are, so now we are a little bit motivated to look at this equation, but we realize if the, the system dimension is high, then this is a hyperbolic equation, high dimensional, and anyway, Nonlinear. As an aside remark, but it can be useful because of the difficulties with dimension and because um, of the difficulty of, of the solution of this altogether. Many times we would say, why don't we just linearize the nonlinearity? Then f of y is say a of y, linear, linearized around some trajectory. In this case, not only do we have this formula, which is now a, <clears throat> but we we re can replace this by the gradient of v by the solution of the Riccati equation. If f is linear, if b, if the control enters, enters in an affine way, if l is quadratic, the, <clears throat> the relation, the gradient of v is basically the operation of the Riccati operator in, in the Riccati equation. So, Okay, why don't we just do what so many engineers do? They linearize along the trajectory, 
solve the maybe time dependent uh, Riccati equation and they close the loop by the linearization. Does it always do the job or not? If it always does a reasonably good job, um, then we are very interested in the analysis. But from a numerical point of view, maybe we don't want to take the trouble. So the question is, arises, is the whole HGB, except for aside from its analy analytical beauty, worth the numerical effort? So compared to Ricard is an important thing, and I'll do so later on in a moment. But what if it if it if it's worth the effort, how do we get, how can we conceptually do it? Well, first of all, we can try to solve directly, but we have this curse of dimensionality. Think of the ODE that I wrote as the discretized version of a PDE, then we'd have a hyperbolic equation in 10 to the three, four, whatever variables, that's undoable. Now, these days, many times people use a tensor ink calculus to solve the Ricard equation, or we are training neural networks, or we are doing Taylor expansion, or we can solve on, for many initial conditions, we can solve the open loop problem and we interpolate, and these are data-driven techniques. There are hope formulas, but I should say, in, from my point of view, they are only useful in very, very specific situations. Um, then there's max plus algebra techniques, maybe other techniques. So they are from various points of view, HTP is now attacked in the last several years, but I'm sure that, it, that I can say there is, it's important, but there is no method now which is clearly the winner of, of, of all the others. Today, I try to address three topics. I'll talk solving via tensor calculus. I'll train neural networks and Taylor expansions. I try to explain the concept or some of the concepts and ideas. Uh, I don't go into details. But before that, go back to this issue, is HGB worth the effort? And maybe also, if somebody has a question at this moment, it's, it's, it's a good time to take a question now before I roll on. Otherwise, I continue. It's OK. So let's look at a um, control semilinear equation. It's called the neural whitehead equation. But it's also called the Schlödel model. It's um, because it's also called <clears throat> by all kinds of other uh, names, depending on the application which it relates to. It describes excitable systems such as neurons or axons. It relates to the Schlödel model in theoretical chemistry to really banal convection, etc. So we want to control this. We want to stabilize this equation by a scalar valued control, and the control acts on a small subset, little omega, in the spatial domain minus one one. The temporal domain is minus is zero infinity. We have Neumann boundary conditions and an initial condition. We know that zero and plus and minus one are, are equilibria, all three of them. I use here that I had homogeneous Neumann conditions. Zero is unstable and plus minus are <clears throat> stable locally. Now we take the PDE, we discretize in space. So we have an ODE. And it's already a high dimension. I think we had um, dimension 40. Yeah? So solving HTB in dimension 40 is already a challenge. Let's see at the state we start at the, the norm of the initial condition it happens to be 10. And if we don't control, well, this the cost doesn't blow up in this case, but it's hanging around and doesn't stabilize, doesn't go to zero. It, there's the, the, no, con, no control costs, we don't do anything. I use the, what I refer, related to the linearization. 
So we can solve the <clears throat> linear quadratic regulator problem in brown. You see, it somehow converge, at least it decays over the first three times intervals. But whatever it does later on, it's very, very slow. The control cost is the given in, in black on the right and the brown on the right. Now, um, we solve by Hamilton Jacobi Berman equation in dimension, four, in dimension 14 and in, the, in dimension 40. And for sure, that control stabilizes. Dimension 14 is that's the control cost. That's the for dimension 14, that's for 40. It's cheaper than the LQR and it stabilizes. So is it worth all the work? Well, I think it is. I go to my first chapter, so to speak, and it's steps towards a neural network based optimal feedback control approach. Okay. So for convenience, I repeat the problem under consideration, a nonlinear control system. Uh, we are having stabilization functional. I work in the space W infinity. The space of all functions are two functions with values in I in here and the derivatives are now two. If we have an function in this space, it has the property that y of t goes to zero as t tends to infinity. That's the good space. Our interest is in optimal feedback stabilization. So we are looking for a function f star so that if it acts on the state, if we close the loop, then it stabilizes. There exists such a function, and there exists such an optimal function as from the <clears throat> HTP theory. So it's in fact it's p transpose gradient v. If I would if I had the gradient v, I just stick it in here and I'm, my work is done. In what follows, I'll work with my initial conditions in a compact neighborhood y0 of the origin. And I assume that for initial conditions in cap y0, the trajectories are in w infinity, they are bound and bounded. So I assume stabilizability. If the system is controllable, oh, even better. Okay, but I assume stabilizability on a compact neighborhood. I want to find a technique how to find f without really calling upon the value function directly. Okay, so I want such a calligraphic f that I stick in here. f is now, f of y is now the control. f of y is now in place of the control. Where the calligraphic f is, the <clears throat> is made of the Nemitsky operator from the function f, which is just a Lipschitz function on the set to a little two times the neighborhood of the set that I'm working on. If f of the zero is zero. So if you give me this calligraphic f, I am so pleased. And if you minimize this, I am even more pleased. Now I'm saying I want to find such an f. I'm minimizing over a tremendously big set. So, and I have only one trajectory along which I learn. I call this optimization, but in today's language, that's learning. We are learning the calligraphic F. And it is a problem which is tremendously underspecified in a sense because we are only learning along one trajectory. Yes, that's correct. But it's not so stupid after all because of the <clears throat> Bellman principle. I mean, if we, <clears throat> we are learning along each point of the trajectory. So already we can say, the, say we are not learning from this one initial condition by zero, but along all the trajectory. But in fact, it may not be enough. We are taking a family y of initial conditions. Uh, I goes from one to n. We learn for all these initial conditions. We are looking at this functional for all these initial conditions. We take the mean of the cost. 
And for each initial condition, the dynamical, the control dynamical system has to hold. All right. And of course, the natural step further is to do this in a probabilistic sense. So we take a, <clears throat> uh, on our space of initial conditions by zero, uh, we take a measure mu. It could be a point measure. It could be a distributed measure. We have the Bochner space of the L infinity <clears throat> functions from y0 to w infinity. And we minimize this stochastic problem over a complete probability space. OK, we can check that this problem admits a solution. A solution will be now not one trajectory, but it will be the whole family originating from y zeros in the probability space y zero. Of course, when it comes to computations, we are going to sample. Okay. Now, how to attack this problem? Uh, yeah, yeah, we couldn't just discretize H now, but how to discretize H? I propo we propose to do this by neural networks. Now, not when we started, I, had, I didn't know much, or I, I didn't know, I can say, I didn't know almost anything about neural networks. And so I, so we studied what they are and what they can do. And we especially learned that they have a very, very good approximation properties. So and that enhanced by this property of good, um, enticed by this property of excellent approximation property, we want, we are, it, it is suggested that we use neural networks. A neural network eventually is a function of x. It's a composition of functions of x parameterized by what I, I call theta here. Now, how are these functions composed, each one of them? Essentially, it is an affine mapping. Wi is an, not necessarily a quadratic, but a rectangular matrix plus some offset bi. And then on these coordinates of this output, on each of the coordinate, we have a so-called activation function. You may think of a function which is zero on the interval from minus infinity to zero, and then it's like a ramp going to one, or a sigmoid function. The uppermost level is goes without the activation function. So we take all these functions, we <coughs> compose them. Uh, the, the parameters are the wi's and the bi's. They are the theta. They are going to be the unknowns in the learning program. And the, the dimensions are what's called the architecture of a network. Of course, we want our feet. So, so far, the network. Now, <clears throat> now, we want our feedback function to be zero at the origin, that because of the stabilization issue. So to have that, we need to just subtract the function here and evaluate it at zero. So these are our candidates, parameterized candidates for the feedback functions. All right. Now, we want to not just use them. We want to also justify that they are used. So we need approximation theory. So we looked at uh, what's available in approximation theory, and we find a lot in the space of continuous functions, uh, how well a function f star can be approximated by f thetas, but we want more. We want it in the C1 norm. We want the gradients also, okay? That's what we need. I mean, this is the gradient of f is the object which we stick in for the feedback. Okay. Moreover, there are these coefficients. Eventually, these coefficients go into the optimal control problem. We want existence. So we have to we get radial unboundedness, coercivity. Either we put on a penalty 
or we put on constraints. We try, in our case, we try to, to put as many of these <clears throat> to get the coercivity mainly by constraints. So we can prove the following theorem, which we may be even new within the neural network community. Take two constant eta one and eta two, and then assume a vector that the activation function sigma is not a polynomial, and it's C1. Then for any epsilon, for any tolerance you choose, there exists a dimension, and there exists an architecture, and there exist parameters, and we could choose the a priori bound on at least one of the matrices in all <coughs> the, uh, the, B, the BIs, so that, such that we have this approximation property. So for, for the last two slides, I was just doing approximation theory by neural networks. So now we go and use this in our feedback optimal control situation. Okay. So first thing is I have this semi-linear equation here. Oh no, it is, it is completely non-linear equation here, sorry. Uh, where the non-linear feedback operator is appears. I have to argue that we have existence and uh, that the solutions are epsilon close on the bounded set that I'm working on all the time. Okay, now I can approximate. I still need to solve the optimal control problem. All right, the minimization problem. I minimize, that's the original functional here. I need to accept, I look a little j because now the parameters are not the controls anymore, the couple graphic ages, but they are really the parameters of the network. We need to get existence from somewhere. So we are putting on partially regularization terms partially like really <clears throat> constraints. The, this is our indicator functions and constraints. Under these, these conditions, we can prove existence. We can prove existence of the optimal control problem and we can address convergence of the optimizers. I don't want to do this in detail here, I just want to say that if we stick in for every epsilon, the solutions by epsilon, that epsilon could go to zero, they converge as we expected, the, the codes converge and the solutions converge subsequently. Now, does it work in practice? Let's look at some results. Of course, we cannot compute on the infinite time horizon. So we also have to fix the time horizon sufficiently large. In our case, we fixed eight layers for the networks. For the network, uh, all the matrices are square matrices. The activation function is a little bit regularized ramp function. So that on the residual, and we added a residual connection in the terminology of neural networks. All right, the first example is an electric circuit. The model is an ODE three-dimensional with two inductors, one capacitance, pa capacitor, and the control enters as the voltage into this circuit. The state variables are the two magnetic fluxes and the charge. <clears throat> and we have the combined magnetic and electric energy, which is just the square of Y. And then we have the control cost here. And want to stabilize. Without stabilization, the system would oscillate. But out, with stabilization, we want it stabilizes. And the optimal state is given here, the closed loop optimal state. In a moment, I say more. And on the right, you see the behavior of the optimal control. It's just this negative, quite largely negative, 
it was a little bit above zero and then it uh, transiently and then it goes to zero. This is a linear pr state problem, linear in the control, and the cost is quadratic. So this is the super classical situation for, lin for a <clears throat> linear quadratic regulator and the optimal control is precisely given by the solution of the Riccati equation. The solution of the Riccati equation, we wanted <clears throat> to compare it with our neural network approach. So we were just checking whether we are doing fine. We were just checking whether the neural network state, optimal state, and the Riccati optimal state are the same or close. And in fact, here by the eyeball metric, red is above blue, they are the same, and the feedback controls are the same. So this is just um, for the proof of concept. The proof of concept is, pa is now passed. Um, now we go to PDs and discretized PDs. So this is a Thunderbolt-like uh, um, equation, the Thunderbolt-like oscillator, because I, I sort of snug it in the y cubic still here, make it more, it's on the right-hand side to work it more unstable. We have a control, U of y and t. Um, <clears throat> we have, okay, we have Neumann boundary conditions. Um, the origin uh, is a, unstable, steady state anyway. And we take one, two, three, four, five initial conditions. And our measure is the point measure in the sense of the probability space. And we train a network based on, and then we look what's happening. Okay, too many, in, too much information may be at first. Here is the, uh, the trajectories of the uncontrolled system. Okay, out of the second order equation, we make a first order equation in the variables y1 and y2. So on the abscissa and the ordinate, you see y1 and y2. The dots are initial conditions. Don't, at this moment, it make, doesn't make any difference whether it's blue or red. So you travel down here, you travel to, um, orbit and on that orbit to stay there. Okay. And all the initial conditions, anyway, they don't, none of them go to the origin. They always take to infinity. That's the uncontrolled case. Now we do a linear quadratic. Okay, now we do the linear quadratic. Uh, we take all these initial conditions. The linear quadratic regular problem does reasonably well for initial conditions, which are sufficiently close to the origin, which is here where my mouse is. And those initial conditions, which are too far from the origin, they escape to infinity. Well, linear quadratic after linearization anyway, so we are, we, we are, that's what it does. It is not so, it's semi-global, but not global, it's, it's local. No, it is local, but everything that they can be proved is that there exists a neighborhood such that you get stabilization. Now, uh, we look at the neural network situation. Now, the difference initial conditions in red and blue becomes relative. Red initial conditions are those initial conditions which we used for the valid for the validation, uh, for the, excuse me, blue are those which are the ones we used for training. So we trained our network on the basis of the red, uh, blue, excuse me, blue initial conditions. Well, they better go to zero and they do. Okay. But then we use that feedback operator. We use that feedback operator. Let me see somewhere here that feedback operator and gave it completely new initial conditions. These completely new initial conditions and hopefully they are also stabilized, the trajectories. And in fact, they do. Okay. So for the Vanderpool, it does also a quite a reasonable job. All right. So, um, and we tried the same for viscous burgers and the, I don't, uh, for viscous burgers. And again, you can see 
that, for example, for anyway, if uh, you see lots of infinities uh, for the <clears throat> uncontrolled, you see infinities uh, blows up. Uh, the linear quadratic regular that was up, the neural network converges in many cases, or in all neural network converges in all cases. All right. So far, the training of neural network is a first technique, and uh, I have time to present the second one. I present a structure exploiting policy iteration to attack the solution process of the Navier's uh, Hamilton-Yakovi Bellman equation, where the feedback is repeated here. By means of what's called policy iteration or Howard's algorithm in the community, I would nowadays prefer it to the, just call it a Newton method. But, there's a method called Newton Kleinman for the Riccati equations. And so it really resembles also Newton Kleinman. But basically think of, I think of what I'm presenting now, just the Newton iteration. Well, you think it's sort of simple, right? It's linear here and quadratic here. Yes, but this is, uh, I mean, we are differentiating the, diff, uh, the value function the dimension is tremendous, etc. So it really takes takes a care to do this in high dimensions. Okay. So I show the algorithm first. We choose an initialization. It needs to be stabilizing. And then we we use a stabilizing initial control, and we choose a tolerance. And then um, we continue. You have so we have an U zero, we have a U zero, and we solve for gradient of V one. People call it the generalized HTB equation. I don't know why, because but that's the common terminology. Once we have the Vn plus one, we update the control and we iterate. And hopefully we get, when we stop, hopefully we get a good approximation to V star or the gradient of V star and U star. The initial condition must already be stabilizing. So that may be a shortcoming. If we don't have one at hand, discounting the value function can help. And that's what we generically do. But still, these equations, which now become the focus of attention in the following slides, are challenging in spite of the fact that they are just linear. Um, so please note that in the overall problem for HTP equation, where the subject to PDEs, uh, we have two infinities. We have the PDEs, which is infinite dimensional, which needs to be discretized. And then we have, then we have a H, an optimal control subject non ODE, nonlinear ODE, and then we need to solve the HGB equation, which is again infinite dimensional. So two infinite dimensionalities. There are structurally very important issues. Number one, we use a mesh-free discretization of the dynamical system. So finite difference, finite elements are out. Rather, we choose pseudo-spectral methods combined with collocation techniques. For example, collocation based on Chebyshev polynomials to get to go from the PDE to the ODE. All right. So we'll go from the have a, we have a finite dimensional system in the state variables by one through by D. And then here we assume that the free dynamics, the F, is such that it is separable in each coordinate. What do I mean? One coordinate Fi can be written as the product 
in K of functions of one variable. So functions of the variable x1, x2, x, x up to xd. And then maybe finitely many of these expressions. Okay, so we have this tensor uh, to take care of in our computation. One is for the first one is for the coordinate, the second one for the summand in this expansion, and the third coordinate for the separability function. All right. So once we have done that, um, let's look at the linear equation that I talked about above, and where I said, um, people call it generalized HGB equation, GHGB. Okay, we need to solve for this. All right, now I discretize the V of X. Okay. The V of X, <coughs> um, let V, v X, little VJ, be a complete set of this d-dimensional <coughs> space of d-dimensional polynomial basis. And we shall approximate V uh, in these spaces. That is the first in elements. In a Galerkin type setting now. So now, if we have V, we can <clears throat> assume we have V, then we have this. We can get to UN by simply putting acting with the gradient on it. Um, every term needs to be expanded, and we take we get a dense system for the unknown C. So we get a dense uh, the, the matrix depends on the previous um, uh, level of the C's, and we solve for the CN plus one. So this linear system is solved. Not quite. We still do a little bit. But so far, I summarize what our decision we are, um, what we decided upon. It is what are the ingredients of the policy iteration that Professor Kali said and myself, and now I jointly with Dolgov, um, Sergei Dolgov, we are working out. Number one, mesh free uh, discretization of the PD, separability of the nonlinearity. Galerkin approximation of the generalized HGB equation using globally supported polynomials like monomials or Legendre polynomials. Well, still we are stuck with high dimensional integrals. I mentioned Galerkin approximation. Galerkin. So we have all. So again, we use separability. Now we have huge tensors, and we are very appreciative of the. Colleagues who have worked on tensor train uh, data compression, and we use that and actually co uh, um Dolgov is an expert in this. So we are introducing the um, tensor train rank. Before that, we should still count the complexity. It's n times t times r square. And so the number of unknowns is basically related to uh, this number, where epsilon is the approximation quality we want to follow. But OK, this is, this is suggestive of being linear in N and D, as opposed to N to the D number of degrees of freedom, which we would have without the tensor calculus. And then we solve the linear system by alternating linear schemes. Why do we just use alternating linear scheme and not any of the other linear solvers? Because it preserves the TT tensor plane struct, the TT structure. And I should say, I should, when I ask the question, is the whole thing worth the effort? I say, and here are the results, right? I say, um, linear quadratic regular, we had a problem where it doesn't stabilize without controls. So the linear quadratic regulator stabilized in HGP, but very, very, very slowly. And this stabilizes very nicely. So um, this, how were these uh, results computed for the neural white tensor equation? They were solved by tensor train techniques. I have about 10 minutes left, unless somebody says I should stop now.
No, no, go, go, go ahead. We have to... <laughs> okay. 12 minutes. Still yeah. 12 minutes. I have 12 minutes. Okay. Thank you. I'll take it. Oh, the, ah, <laughs> I have one there. So, okay. Now, from the D as control theories, we are so happy to see that, right? But of course, from the point of data compression, you want to see that whether the predicted um, behavior, namely the linear behavior with respect to dimension, is really can be observed. And the num we are plotting here the number of, of operations, uh, uh, iterations, to reach um, a certain threshold. And we see really a linear dependence all over up until dimension 40. These calculations are done in dimension one for the PDE. So dimension two is challenging. Eh? So we used 11 times 11, which is, well, yeah, but uh, for, for which for finite differences, finite elements is useless uh, somehow. But for spectral techniques is mm, quite reasonable already. And it was also working successfully. OK. I come to my third and last topic, which is Taylor expansions. But before I do Taylor expansions, I show you the system upon which we, the control system for which we use it. It's the Volker-Planck equation. So the Volker-Planck equation is, is sort of the model for lots of particles uh, subject to potentials. And the potential, if there's a confining potential, W like, three minima, two maxima, the solution of the focal plank should be, there should be lots of particles where there's a sink. Eh? So there should be lots of particles here and not. So the solution should be something like this. For the, this should be the steady state solution of the one d focal plank. So that's where we are. So we have particles uh, stochastically by modeled by the <coughs> Duran equation uh, blocking, and then we want to stabilizing by control. So we're having a probability distribution uh, satisfying the Langevin equation between the PDF uh, version of it, which is the focal plan. So it satisfies the PDF, satisfies a parabolic system in space time with a variational boundary condition, initial condition. W is the given potential. And this solution looks like, like this, and W was something like this. Okay. Um, since we are talking about probabilities, um, we normalize, of course. Okay. And now we would like to control because this steady state, um, oh yeah, we, okay, this steady state is reached very, very slowly. So we take our potential. There's a, <clears throat> um, the reference potential and a control potential. The control potential is alpha. We choose it. That can be the, the form of the laser gun. But the amplitude of the laser gun is at our disposal. Okay. Then we do U of T, and we hope that we reach this stationary distribution faster than without. Well, what do I mean? The particles have to cross these Ws. The particles have to climb over. The particles are somewhere. They have to climb over to come to the steady state. Here, the, <laughs> the mountain is not too high, but it could be high. Huh? So, so the question arises is also what to, how to choose good alphas. I'm not doing this here. Now, in this case, um, the steady state was not the origin. The steady state is the Boltzmann distribution. So we do have to do a shift, and after the shift, we have a bilinear optimal control problem. Linear here and linear here. It is true that 
are in rho infinity is stable, but it's extremely slow. So control is desired. I learned this by some from some chemists, the, the, the theoretical chemists at the TU Berlin. So we have. Um, uh, so let's look here. That's our. We want to come with our <clears throat> our system to the um, black curve. And we have an initial condition here, and it should spread and should quickly reach. We are doing the uncontrolled one um, and the controlled one. One of them is uh, the uncontrolled, and one of them is the control. I ask you to guess. Time is rolling. Uh, OK, now we can already guess. The controlled one is the blue one. The red one is the uncontrolled. It converges because the infinity is stable, but ever so slowly. We are almost there with the controlled one and the uncontrolled one. Okay. So feedback control. Okay. After time 16. So what do we do? We are see, considering now, we are so motivated by Foucault Planck to think to consider bilinear optimal control problems. We want to stabilize. And we assume that AB is stabilizable, but there is still the operator N. These are cost and our minimal value function. We are now experts in it. Um, that's the MGB equation, very specific because of the bilinearity. And this is the associated Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. And that's the optimal feedback law by means of HGB equation. It's a little different now from before because we have the nonlinear term acting also on the control here. These are the new terms. But I, I, I don't want to go back now and do this by means of the Howard algorithm. I don't want to do it by means of neural networks. I want to present a third and last idea, which is a Taylor expansion. What is the basic idea? We want to do a Taylor, Taylor expansion of the value function in the neighborhood of zero, because this is now our steady state. So there is v at zero, first derivative, etc. Taylor expansion, sure. Once we have it, we have all these guys, then we have a feedback formula. That can be derived very easily. So the idea is to use Taylor expansion or to learn at least from the Taylor expansion. The idea is very, very old. The paper, the idea goes back to Albrecht, maybe 60s of the last century. Then look, Mr. Craner, Art Craner in California is still working on it. He is a very Impressive gentleman, older, much older than myself, and we communicate, he visits, um, but he is really working on ODEs. In, in, there's really not much work in the VDE. The only person who has, only one paper who has a little bit worked on it, uh, who have a little bit worked on it, is Tevene Pucho and Raymond in a very specific situation. So we are interested in the precise structure of the case derivative. We want formulas, and once we have formulas, we want to see whether we can use them. Before I go to a crowded slide, let me make sure that some parts are simple. The origin, v at zero is zero. That's the boundary condition. So this we don't need to worry about. v at zero is zero, and v away from the origin is greater or equal to zero. Anyway, the cost function is y squared plus u squared. So the first derivative is zero, right? So we are talking about the second derivative and higher order terms. The second derivative, we would make an awful mistake if we don't find Riccati. So we are really interested in the higher order derivatives. All right. So let us return to the HGB equation. I have indicated here in blue, red, and 
orange, just to make sure that now if I take derivatives, you can somehow follow where the terms are, right? <laughs> one differentiation in the direction of one derivative with respect to x at x in the direction z1. So you're not surprised to see the second derivative. You're not surprised to see this term here. Uh, you are not surprised to see, etc. And then you check, you plug in z1 at the origin, and you plug in x at the origin, 0, 0. You see that 0 is equal to 0. We know after you go through it in detail. So everything is 0, no news. Uh, two differentiations. OK, two differentiations. These are the terms. That already looks horrible, but we know quite a bit. We know that the first derivative is 0. Right, so we are using this. This multiplies the first derivative, actually. And then we look at this one. Ah, that's interesting, because this is only a quadratic term. This is going to be from the Riccati. And there's another Riccati one here, and this is the z square. So after you will cross everything out, this is precisely Riccati. So far, so simple. And now third order. It's a little bit of a nightmare. And if, but if you take it serious, it, at first it looks like a nightmare. But what's good about it, it's linear in the third derivative. It's linear if we keep going, it's linear in the fourth, it's linear in all higher derivatives. These are nothing, the, nothing but the higher derivatives are nothing but. Um, not, um, like, uh, Lyapunov equations. They are nothing but Lyapunov equations. I don't go into them, but I just want to make sure all the higher derivatives are Lyapunov equations, and we have a nice formula for them. I mean, we have a computable formula if we again use tensor calculus. Once we have it, we get convergence rate estimates by use of these formulas for the value function, for the optimal control, for the optimal states, and for the optimal controls as a function of the degree where we stop our Taylor expansion, which is P. And that's the third methodology. Yeah, for the numerical realization, uh, this, these are the Yapunov equations that you need to solve by tensor rank again. Uh, then there is, one has to invert the matrix for this inversion of a matrix, it's, we are using, first day we, do a, uh, we do balancing for, uh, for reduction purposes. Then we have to invert the matrix. We use, this is a stable matrix. Uh, we use a well-known quadrature formula, by now well-known quadrature formula, going back to Kassidik, Hackbusch, and Steiner. We, so we know suitable weights and we compute and um, this computation for the Taylor expansion for the optimal feedback loss. Um, now, this computation shows whether higher order Taylor expansion terms make any difference or not. We can produce an optimal control by solving open loop problems. So black are the open loop problems. And now we are looking at Riccati. That's blue. So it's quite distant from black. So we are interested, ah, are the higher order terms helping? Do they do better? And do they even look as if they would numerically converge? They do much better and they converge. These are local results. All that I presented a little bit rapidly at the end are local results if the initial conditions are sufficiently small. I do not claim that this is the genuine behavior for Taylor expansion. Of course not. But Taylor expansion, and to understand the structure of Taylor expansion for the HEB solution is a valuable. Oh, a thing, I think. I did not 
give a table of content, but um, in, in place of a table of content, I give a summary. I talked about Hamilton Jacobi Berman equation from the point of view of a pro numeric approaches which can eventually lead to numerical results, uh, efficient numerical results. Quite a few groups, and I know one or two or even more may are listening, are working on these equations with techniques, also with some techniques which I'm sorry I didn't mention. Uh, tree structure, for example, and others. I didn't mention all of them yet. There's the curse of dimensionality. Of course, I pointed it out. What I talked about was training of a neural network, policy iteration, we exploited the separable structure in tensor calculus, and at the end, Taylor expansion, and then we need model reduction, and again, tensor calculus. With these, I would, I come to, came to the end. I thank you for attending, for your patience, and I stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, we have time for uh, some questions. So uh, if you want to uh, ask a question, please uh, uh, switch on your uh, microphone or, or write a chat uh, as you want. Is there any question there? Oh, I yeah. So, th thank you for this very nice talk. And I, I was uh, I was thinking, considering the, the case of the Van der Poel uh, type of, of model. So here you are using the, the neural network approach, and it seems to work quite efficiently, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you compare to the other techniques. This is what, what seems to be the best or not? Um, whether we compared, uh, well, no, no, <laughs> no, I honestly, we did not, com okay, we compared to Riccati. Mm -hmm. um, and I skipped over what's called PSE. PSE is state dependent Riccati equations. There's a technique uh, which, uh, you you do your expansion of the Riccati around a state, and then out comes this state-dependent Riccati. State-dependent Riccati is really a tremendous competitor. Uh, it's quite good, okay? <laughs> so I should say thanks for the question, because beating, beating, beating simply Riccati um, is one way, but state dependent Riccati is quite good. But so you see, for example, that state dependent Riccati stabilizes in this case, in all cases. You see all, also these one, two, three outliers, two out, which were not handled here, they are now handled. But the, or, the orbit is awkward. Yes. The, it does not reach, there's a limit cycle phenomenon behind this whole thing, which I didn't talk about. Um, but there are some topological dynamics behind this. With, okay. um, it goes very quickly to the limit cycle, and then it, uh, it then it, in the x1, y1, y2 plane, uh, or circle, it goes to the origin uh, here. So uh, I didn't look at the optimal, uh, I could look at the optimal controls. I don't do it here. The controls, anyway, are cheaper here than they are here. The controls are cheaper. I did not compare the three techniques that I explained against each other. Uh, I did not run them against each other. Okay, yes. But I, each of these numerical results, excuse me if I take a sentence, because I will, should really say I had very, very good and strong collaborators who helped with all the numerics. This is a lot of work, okay? So comparing is easily, is not easy. <laughs> each comparison, uh, uh, there are people really helping, okay. Mm, sure. But, but for instance, if you try to do the, the Taylor expansion of the Lyapunov functional, 
you expect something like PAC feedback or something closer to neural network feedback? Um, oh, you don't know. I, I do not know. I really do not know. Um, I, I do not know. Um, that, that the region of attraction, that you are basically asking the reason of, of the region of attraction for Taylor expansion. Yeah, something and, like that. And that, that's very, very complicated. I, we do not know. We are aware of the fact that we don't know all the time. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's <laughs> we are, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe Mr. Craner knows something in specific okay. cases for all the for ordinary differential equations in very specific cases. So Craner may be an expert on that. Ask Craner. I do not know. Thanks. Enrique? Yes, there's a question by Dante Calis. It's uh, written in the chat. It says, uh, concerning the first part of the talk, do you have any other comments regarding the choice of the neural uh, architecture? Uh, <laughs> why did you take a residual? Neural? Okay, well. <laughs> Is it purely uh, fit for what? Oh, thank you. Uh, no, but, but, okay, well, no, no, Dante, I'm, I'm very happy for the question, but uh, no, it is it, it, honestly, it's trial and error at the moment. Um, it's trial and error at the moment. I say one thing, one thing, however, I was sneaking it by, uh, where I explained the neural networks. And then in practice, I said, ah, this extra plus X here, uh, what's called, people call residual connection. That's a little bit uh, of a secret maybe still. That's very useful. <laughs> so this X, keep it in mind. Uh, keep it in mind, uh, carry it here, and add a plus x where my mouse is, outside. That is quite useful. But otherwise, about the neural network structure, um, no, we, we tried, and uh, eight is too much. We, we are now using three layers. OK. Uh, another question uh, from the chat. What is in, is by Bojan uh, Jesloski? Uh, what is the nature of the proof of the approximation theorem? Is it similar to the original proof of Sivenko using Hambanet? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Or oh, you mean for the approximation or for this uh, function approximation theorem? If 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 this one is made. Yes, it is just very clear, a combination of all the classical tricks. I, I, I went through the old, or we went through the old papers and um, learned the tricks and combined the tricks. Analysis, really analysis, uh, nitty gritty analysis. A little bit of complex analysis. Oh, uh, I have a question. Uh, I have a. A small question. Uh, when you introduce the numerical approximation, you uh, are, uh, you need to uh, replace the infinite time by finite time by large time in order to uh, make the computations, I, I suppose. Uh, yeah. So my question is, uh, can you say something uh, uh, since the beginning uh, uh, working with the finite time? Large yeah. time. Is there any approximate result uh, related to the uh, methods that you are using to compute the control? You are talking about this one, T. Yeah, I, I think you are talking. Replace infinite time by yeah. finite time. Yeah. No, we no, no. Yeah. In, in practice we did uh, we tested somehow uh, how stable. How I mean, these systems are exponentially stabilizable with a transient bound, so they are of the type m omega. M omega in the, in the semi group language, GM omega semi groups, the, the cl optimally closed one. Um, and we, so we tested somewhat, and we had a we had an, a we had a, a practical experience. What is reasonable, uh, and then that was it. 
So a combination of the fact that we know that our system is exponentially stabilizable. Of course, we don't know when it reaches 10 to the power minus three, but we tested somewhat and then we, we are happy with our choice. Engineering. Okay. Okay, well, uh, if there's no other questions, thank you very much for your talk, for your very interesting talk. And uh, thank you for all the participants who are attending. Next week, uh, we have we will have a double session with uh, two young uh, researchers. And uh, I hope you will be here uh, again. So uh, see you.